Of all the camera specs that get thrown around, the number of megapixels is often used to determine whether a camera is good enough or not. I think it has a lot to do with people liking this single definable number that they can compare and contrast directly to other cameras and say, this one is better than this one. But the truth is the number of megapixels is only a part of the equation. So today I wanna to dive into how megapixel count is not everything, how too many megapixels can actually be a bad thing, and overall, how many megapixels do you actually need in your camera? Welcome to Photography 101 with Will. I largely blame the smartphone industry for getting us really focused on the megapixel count of cameras because selling the new Samsung Galaxy whatever by saying it has a 100 megapixel camera is a really easy and definable way to assign value to that product. And then you think, oh, well, my iPhone is only 12 megapixels. This one must be so much better. And that extends into professional cameras too. But if megapixels were the only thing that mattered, then every professional shooter would be using the latest Samsung Galaxy phone and not a 24 megapixel R6 Mark II, for example. First, we need to understand what a megapixel actually is. Every digital camera captures light using a sensor. A sensor is a flat rectangle on the inside of your camera made up of millions of tiny little pixels. These pixels are tiny little squares that are designed to capture in the light and convert it into electric signals. The number of pixels in a sensor determines the final resolution of the image that you capture. A megapixel is simply one million of these little pixels. If you take a look at my Canon R6 Mark II, for example, it shoots photos that are 6,000 pixels by 4,000 pixels. If you multiply those two numbers together, you get the area of the sensor in number of pixels, which is 24 million pixels. So we have a 24 megapixel sensor. The more megapixels you have, the more detail you can capture in your images. And the more detail you have, the larger you can display those images without any pixelation of the image being noticeable. And pixelation is where we start to see those physical squares show up as little squares and they're noticeable to our eyes instead of it blending together in one cohesive image. But after a certain point, we have so many megapixels that our eyes can't actually tell the difference. So we get to a point where adding more megapixels isn't really noticeably affecting anything. But on top of megapixels, there are a few other reasons why we think of an image as being high quality or sharp. So what else makes an image high quality? The most important thing I want you to take away from this video, if anything, is this. Megapixel count on its own is not everything and it doesn't actually even matter that much in most cases. If it did, I would throw away my 24 megapixel professional camera and shoot everything on my 45 megapixel iPhone. But side by side, this 45 megapixel camera and this 45 megapixel phone look very different when you compare the images. So what else is contributing to that? The lens sharpness, the depth of field, digital noise, and just how each sensor interprets the light and converts that information into colors is going to be different in each camera and it affects the image quality significantly. If a camera has a lower megapixel count but is better in all of those aspects that I just mentioned, it's going to look higher quality than the higher megapixel camera. I mentioned in my intro that too many megapixels can actually be bad, so let me explain. Canon's top of the line R1 camera is only 24 megapixels. Sony's FX3, which is widely considered to be one of the best compact cinema cameras ever, is only 12 megapixels. Let's talk about pixel density. Pixel density refers to the number of pixels in a given physical space. For example, both the Canon R5 and the Canon R6 have the same physical size full frame 35 millimeter sensor, but this one has 45 megapixels and this one has 24 megapixels. But since the sensor itself is the same physical size, the R5 has a much higher pixel density because it's fitting more pixels into the same size space. Pixel density can lead to sharper images, but there's a trade-off because it also causes some problems. The more pixels you jam into the same space, the smaller those pixels have to be. And larger pixels capture more light with less noise, which is a big part of why something like Sony's FX3 has really great low light performance. The higher your pixel density is, the more noise will be introduced into your photos and videos as you have to increase the ISO. File write times and file sizes are also an important factor here. My R5 file sizes are about 50 megabytes per photo and my R6 is about 20. This can really add up when you're storing the files like later, but it also impacts your shooting. Cameras have a buffer, a temporary little storage area where the photos go as they're being written to your memory card. Once the buffer fills up, the camera can't take any more photos until it offloads those images in the buffer onto your memory card. And the larger the files are, the longer it's going to take for the buffer to move to the card, and also the less files you can actually have on the buffer. This isn't really noticeable if you're shooting like one photo at a time, 
But if you're shooting something fast paced like sports and you're doing lots of bursts, that buffer is gonna fill up really quickly and then you might miss your next shot because you have to wait for the camera to catch up. This is a part of the reason why the R1 is only 24 megapixels because although something like the R5 Mark II can shoot in 30 photos per second, that buffer fills up within a couple seconds and then you have to sit and wait. Then if you wanna get really technical, there's sensor readout times. Most cameras still have a rolling shutter even when shooting fully electronic. And a rolling shutter just means that when you capture an image, it's activating the rows of pixels one at a time going down the sensor. So the whole image isn't technically captured at the same time. You take the photo and it starts capturing from top to bottom. Now it does this insanely quickly, but there is still a several millisecond gap between when the first row of pixels starts capturing and the last row of pixels starts capturing, which means because images are flipped because of how lenses work, that means technically the bottom of your image is a little bit older than the top of your image. So your sensor readout speed is just how fast can your camera activate all those pixels and capture and scan that full image. This is noticeable when shooting high speed action or even just in video panning your camera back and forth kind of quickly. You kind of can see in some cameras more than others, this jello kind of effect of straight lines that should be moving perfectly side to side are kind of going like this a little bit and they're jiggling as you pan the camera around. And this is an artifact of part of that image being captured earlier than the other part of the image. And higher megapixel counts can attribute to this effect being more noticeable because the more pixels you have, the more lines that need to be activated in order to capture the whole image. So a smaller megapixel count camera can typically have a faster readout speed than a larger megapixel count camera. And the last crazy fact about high megapixel cameras is that in certain cases, they can actually make your video look worse quality and let me explain. My two cameras are a perfect example of this because if I want to shoot 4K 60 frames per second on my R5 and my R6, they go about it a little bit differently. Because on the R5, you're essentially taking an 8K sensor and downsizing it to 4K, there's a lot more information to be processed even though the final output is still just in 4K. And to process all this information in a timely manner and efficiently and save all your files, the R5 Mark II in 60 frames per second 4K does something called line skipping. This is where it doesn't capture the information from every single row of pixels as it goes down. It skips over some of them and puts together that 4K image. Now it's not super noticeable, but if you zoom in, you can actually tell that the R6 Mark II, which doesn't line skip, actually has a bit sharper 4K 60 than the R5 Mark II because it doesn't need to do any fancy footwork to convert that footage into a lower resolution. So hopefully at this point, you're convinced that more megapixels doesn't always mean more better. Now that you know that there are some downsides to higher megapixel count cameras, let's answer the real practical question. How many megapixels do you actually need? So we know eventually we reach a point where there's too many megapixels that our eyes can't tell the difference. And we also know that if we add more and more megapixels, it brings up some issues. So the logical conclusion to that is we need to find the point where we can't tell the difference anymore. And then we don't want any more megapixels than that. Because if we find that sweet spot where it's sharp enough that our eyes are never gonna know, then we don't really need any more megapixels than that because it's only gonna bring more issues. So what is that magic number? Well, it depends on how you expect people to view the final product. It comes down to viewing size and viewing distance. The smaller the image is being displayed, like on a phone screen, and also the further away the image is from your eyes, the less resolution you need in order for it to be perceivably sharp. Because the further we move it away, the less your eyes can tell if there's any pixelation or anything going on. And the smaller the image is, same thing. People often say you need high megapixels if you want to be blowing up your photos to something the size of a billboard. And on the surface level, that makes sense. And a lot of people say that actually, I hear that a lot, but it's actually wrong. And it's a great example of how important just the viewing distance is because the average billboard, even though it's giant, is actually only around two megapixels in resolution. And that's because the typical viewing distance of a billboard is so far away that it can be low resolution and you won't be able to tell because of how far it is. And this goes for viewing size too. Now, if you're viewing an image on a screen, for example, then also the resolution of that screen is really important because the most detail you can display on a screen is whatever that screen's resolution is. If you have a 1080p screen, then any image that's larger than 1080p, you won't actually be able to see any more detail because you're being limited by the screen you're looking at. Now, if you're looking at something on a 1080p screen, you're actually only viewing everything in about two megapixels. And if you're viewing something on a 4K screen, that's actually about 8.3 megapixels. So when it comes to video, 
you have your answer. If you want to shoot 4K video, any sensor over 8.3 megapixels is technically capable of doing that, just as sharp as something with even more megapixels. Since the FX3 is mainly a video camera, this makes perfect sense why they went for 12 megapixels, because with less pixel density, you get larger pixels that can take in more light with less noise, and you don't run into any issues with needing to line skip or anything like that, and you still get some really crisp, high quality 4K video. When it comes to photos, the answer is a little bit more complicated because there's more options for what you can do with photos. If you're not cropping your images and you're only posting them on something like Instagram, then you can actually get away with a criminally low amount of megapixels. No matter what the quality of your image is, Instagram is gonna compress it down to about 1.5 megapixels anyways. So that's really all you need technically for Instagram. But you wouldn't even know anyways because you're viewing it on a phone screen. So it's small enough that 1.5 megapixels is good enough. If you want the option to crop and reframe some of your photos and you also want the option to be able to print your photos a little bit larger, then that's where some more megapixels would come in handy. Now, the sweet spot for this is kind of a preference and is a little bit up for debate. But in my experience, personally, I think about 24 megapixels is the perfect sweet spot for this. Because 24 megapixels still lets you blow up a print to a very large size like the one behind me and you still can get like this close to the print and not see any pixelation. You also have room to crop in a decent amount and no one's really gonna be able to notice the difference. I've been shooting on 20 and 24 megapixel cameras for years and no one has ever said anything to me about the images not being sharp enough. Never come up once. Then if you want the ultimate cropping flexibility, you want to make absolutely massive prints or you just want to shoot in 8K video, then that's where a super high resolution sensor like a 45 megapixel R5 would come in. But hopefully now you understand that a sensor this large isn't always necessary and a lot of the time not even noticeable. Hopefully that cures your FOMO a little bit of feeling like my camera isn't good enough. Uh, if you're shooting on something that's a little more entry level, there are a lot of benefits to professional high-end cameras, but you don't necessarily need 45 megapixels or 100 megapixels or whatever to get a good image. I hope all that made sense. If you have any questions about this, let me know in the comments. Uh, I'll try to answer them. I really want to gear this video more to like the entry level photographer. And I really want to start doing videos like this and going over some of these basics in a little more detail because I've talked to some people who are just getting into photography recently. And it's easy to forget as someone who's been doing this for a long time, that there's certain elements of this that they feel like common sense to me at this point because I've known them for so long. But to someone who's just entering this space, they, people can really use the help with some of these, some of this really basic information. And even some of you that have been shooting for a little while, maybe hopefully learn something in this video too. So let me know if you want to see more photography 101 style videos. I would love to do some more like this, but let me know. Thank you guys for watching. I'll catch you in the next one.